Hi, I'm Bill Seaback, retained headhunter, executive recruiter, search consultant, career coach, that recruitment guy. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a uh, historical perspective on the search business. There have been many trainers over the years who, who have been and uh, remain uh, terrific people in the search industry, some better than others, of course. But no matter who your favorite might be, if you have a favorite, Danny Cahill, Peter Lefkowitz, Barb Bruno, Paul Hawkinson, Hawkinson uh, Gene Rice, uh, Jeff Cohen, and there are you know, a lot of others. Uh, I'm reminded of a very special individual named Tony Byrne. Tony was a successful headhunter and agency owner, and one of the very first recognized professional trainers in the search business. He was a real character, and um, he loved this business, and he loved uh, processes, and he, he loved to give people the chance to do well at this profession. And unfortunately, he died way too young uh, during a conference in uh, Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it was a tragic loss. But before he passed away, he developed the 30 steps to the placement process and a course called Placement 2000. And um, Tony developed a systematic a way to grow uh, and develop our skill set as professional recruiters and um, really was at the forefront of training uh, in our profession. Uh, it was a duplicatable process. It remains a duplicatable process today. And although modified by many, I would say, um, it's a very important foundation to every recruiter or headhunter, whether you're at an agency, on your own, or in a town acquisition team because the rudiments of the business are pretty much the same all across the board. Um, incidentally, I was, upon Tony's passing, I was asked to pick up his schedule of um, training dates around the world, and I, I did that for about two years uh, with uh, Placement 2000. And, um, you know, Tony was a legend in the search business. Um, many people, of course, now don't even know who he was. But uh, people who've been around for a long time might have been trained by him. I was trained by him. And, you know, my, my company uh, brought Tony into our office uh, several times to do live uh, on-site training. It was a really fascinating experience. So I'd like to talk to you today about the 30 steps to the recruitment process uh, by Tony Byrne. Uh, as he originally developed and worded them, I'll have some insights and some amp amplification, of course. And I um, hope you find it uh, useful and worthwhile. Okay, um, number one, you have to take a complete job order. This is absolutely critical. What's a job order? A search assignment. We, we call that a research assignment in the retained world. And um, this involves, oh boy, it could be... A, 20 to 45 minute conversation or more with a client, depending on how much time they can allot to making sure you understand their company, how they operate, their culture, uh, what's needed in the role. And, and I'll do separate training on how to take a, a proper jo job order. But step number one in the, in the search, the 30 step uh, placement process is take a complete job order. Step number two, you have to make a recruiting plan. You can't just wing it. You can't just, you know, do a half-assed search assignment and uh, say, oh, I got some candidates on my desk or whatever and just maybe throw some over the note. Every search is discreet. Every search has to be uh, articulated in a way that you can do a great job for your client and you can be able to communicate to prospective candidates, all of the salient uh, points that a company has to offer and all of the salient skills that the client has to offer in return. So this is a match. Remember, we're, we're making a match that is uh, something that both parties can have a tremendous return on investment from. 
you know, uh, three to five or more years, right? I mean, if you think about a search fee, uh, you need to get a minimum of three years out of that for a good return on investment. And, and it all starts with understanding the search requirements and being able to make a good solid recruiting plan so you know who to go after. Uh, the third step in the, in the search, in Tony Burns' 30-step placement process is to do a file search. Today, we would call that a database search. Your own database. Some of you use LinkedIn Recruiter as, as your database. Uh, we have a separate database here at Orbital Search. So, you know, we have uh, over 100,000 candidates in our database that we've personally talked to. Um, but you have to do a search of that database. And um, you want to be able to go through that in a way that allows you to do number, uh, to fulfill number three, rather, which is pull candidates that you've talked to recently, hopefully, or at some point in the not too distant past, and find out, you know, sort of update their profile. Are they looking for something new at this, at this present time? And you, you also have the ability to go historically, you know, three, four, five, or 10 years or more to talk to people uh, to see if they're interested in, in looking at new opportunities. So that number three is a file search. Uh, number four, Tony called it name gathering, uh, but, you know, we call it sourcing. And um, this would be through resources outside of your primary database. So uh, if you have an, you host an internal database and, of course, LinkedIn and and other you know company databases. Uh, every company has a website now, and they they <laughs> they put their employees' names on the website. So you know that's a great section. And every company uh, has a news section, so you can go to the news section, and they'll a lot of companies list when they hire people and uh, promote people, so you can gather names that way. And um, you want to of course add those into your database, and then. Uh, decide which candidate should go into your pipeline. Okay, uh, the fifth step in the 30-step placement process is contacting candidates. Contacting candidates. Now, this used to be done strictly by phone. So you had to develop a reservoir of telephone skills to be able to Introduce yourself, talk to somebody, and get them to have a communication with you on the phone, uh, and a, you know, obviously, a conversation with you on the phone. And um, so much initial candidate contact now is done electronically or digitally. So uh, email or messages, uh, text messages, and so forth. Most databases, if you know somebody's cell phone number, you can. Uh, write a note and it'll, your database will just text that person. So uh, anyway, candidate contact. Number six in the 30-step placement process originated by Tony Byrne is to develop a candidate profile. Now, this would be a candidate interview or candidate interview. And um, this Profile is kind of an antiquated word, and you know, in terms of my perspective, but basically, you need to do an interview with the candidate, and that can be anywhere from two to six hours. And now, uh, back in the day when I started, you know, three decades ago, we uh, took you know, longhand notes, notebooks, and pump cards, and kept all that information on our short list of candidates, and then you know, regurgitated that back to the employers. <laughs> But of course, now with the databases, you know, if you're a good typist, you can do word for word um, in terms of uh, entering data into your database. So this is a very uh, important aspect, doing a very solid, in-depth interview with your candidate to find out, number one, do they have the skills? Number two, do they have the interest in making a transition? You know, when I talk to candidates, for example, I'll say something, I'll ask a question like, uh, you know, hey, Jim. Uh, do you have a moment of a catch at a bad time? I wanted to find out if it's actually timely for you and I to very discreetly dialogue about competitive opportunities in your career, or do you feel like you're cemented in place? 
And that's kind of one of my initial questions that I want to ask a candidate to see if I can get them into a conversation. Now, keep in mind, that, you know, when we call these people, they're busy doing their job, right? They're at work most of the time. And so ideally, if they say they're interested in talking, you can set something up at night or on the weekend so that they're not at work and, you know, taking advantage of their company's time. So you want to be as direct as possible and conversational as possible at the same time to see, number one, is there, does the person have interest in leaving or looking at other things? And then if they do, let's set up a time that's perhaps more appropriate than, you know, what it is right now since you're at work so that we can have that conversation. Now, my first conversation, my first level of conversation with a candidate might be 10, 15 minutes because, uh, you know, my time's valuable and I'm not going to spend 45 minutes or two hours with somebody unless I qualify them against the opportunity. Now, if they are a class A candidate and I realize right away that they're not right for my client, then I'm absolutely going to talk to them in detail and understand where they're at because I could very well make them an MPC and market that person to all the other companies in the space. Okay, number seven in the 30-step placement process authored originally by Tony Byrne is to uh, present your candidate to your employer. And um, this is something that we we call presentation of a short list. So once you've interviewed a candidate and you decide that they meet the litany of parameters and your client has things to offer that this candidate needs or wants, then you're most likely going to put that person on the short list. You know, if they have obviously legitimate reasons to make a transition and you've validated all those, you know, this, this conversation with a candidate can be two to six hours. So there's a, a lot of information that's going to be flowing back and forth on the in the telephone call. So um, if you decide that they're going to be a shortlisted candidate, you're going to present them to your employer. Now, in the retain business, we normally do a write-up on the candidate. And we also do a verbal presentation uh, to amplify our notes uh, on the candidate from, you know, hours and hours of discussions so that our employer can have uh, participation in the process to say, yes, Bill, uh, I agree with you that, you know, this is some, somebody we absolutely want to interview. By definition, by definition of your functional skill set, every candidate that you recommend should be an A-plus candidate, fully vetted, with legitimate reasons to make a transition. And when you submit that person, you're saying, this is my interpretation of the perfect person for this job. And I hope you agree. So um, anyway, number eight in the step, the uh, third step placement process is you got to set up the first interview. So you present, present the candidate and then you want to set up the interview. Uh, you manage the client schedule, you manage the candidate schedule and you get, the, get them together. Now, typically I recommend a telephone interview first. There are occasions when you can go straight to a face-to-face. -face. That's usually after you have a very solid relationship with your clients. You trust them and they trust you. You know, I have clients where I say, you know, hey, Jeff, I'd like to, uh, you know, I think you should meet Tina. Uh, when can we set it up? And he'll say, here's my calendar. Work it out with her and, uh, you know, I trust you. So, uh, but now that's taken a relationship of a number of years where we've had a lot of successes together. But setting up the first interview is important. Now, step number nine. You have to prep the candidate for the interview. Prep the candidate for the interview. And um, this will happen usually the night before the interview. This could be a 15 to 30 minute call. And uh, you're reviewing the opportunity. You're talking about the people they're going to meet, what the uh, aspect uh, is and what's important from those perspective for those people in the interview process and making sure that the candidate is prepared to respond appropriately to the types of questions they're going to get and um, vice versa to be able to ask intelligent questions as well 
we, and we provide a list of questions that we think our candidates should be asking our clients. Okay, uh, now step 10, you've got to confirm the appointment with the employer and the candidate and then prepare the employer to, you know, meet the candidate. Now, why would you prepare the employer if you've already presented them? Well, usually it's been a couple days since the presentation call. So you want to review the with the employer um, some highlights about the candidate, you know, where they work, what their achievements are, why they're interested in making a transition and why they think, you know, your client is could be a great place for them. So this is very important to make sure that this information is all fresh in the mind of our employer. Make sure that your clients have read and studied the resume and the write-up that you sent over on on the candidate. If you've sent, uh, you've had the if you've had the candidate write a proper resume, a lot of those achievements will be listed in the person's resume. But your employer must read it and understand it before they come together. Why? Candidates will be insulted once they realize you haven't prepared for the interview and you will have lost them before you even open their mouth, your mouth. Okay, uh, number 11. Right after the interview, you got to debrief the candidate. When they are in the lobby or the parking garage of the meeting or on the elevator ride down, they should call you and you can do your debrief questions. We'll cover this at a later time, what the debrief questions are. But... Um, you want to get that information when it's fresh in their mind. All the little and major points that they discovered during the interview, and you want to take notes. And now your, your notes on this is going to be used to help your candidate review. And remember, you're going to be a sounding board for your candidates, and you're going to sort of play back. For, you're going to be their tape recorder. You're going to play back for them what they liked and what they didn't like. Uh, from from the interview. Likewise, you're going to make a separate call to your employer. You'll pre-screen the employer to make sure that their schedule is available after the interview. So we do a quick, a quick debrief, uh, you know, on uh, Jim or Susie or whoever the candidate happens to be. And you're going to do the same type of uh, questioning with the employer. What they like, what they didn't like, what were their areas of concern, what questions do they have. This uh, question issue is very important because Usually in the first interview, there's always going to be a lot of questions that you know didn't come up or didn't there wasn't time to get answered, and you want to make sure that you get a list of those so that for the second interview, those questions are kind of moved to the top of the list and they get answered right. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, so you take a good debrief. Now uh, the employer can say, "Look, I uh, I really didn't like that candidate, and uh, I don't want to move forward, and here's why." So you get the the list of reasons, maybe two or three reasons. Validate those reasons with the employer. Maybe the client, or the candidate rather, felt the same way. And so you'll have a meeting of the minds. They both agreed that it wasn't right for, for either of them. Or maybe there was a miscommunication that happened in that first interview where uh, things need to be clarified and uh, made certain to each other that, oh, this is a mistake in the communication process. I really meant to say this or I felt this way. And then and only then can it be rectified and move to the next stage of the process. So what we want to, want to make sure we uh, understand is that we don't want to have a lot of false negatives. So we don't want to lose the right people for the wrong reasons. Look, not everybody interviews well, okay? There are people who just, you know, they get nervous, uh, they don't have a good day. They had a fight with the spouse on the way to the office. Somebody on the bus pissed them off. Uh, you know, th there could be a hundred reasons why people go into an interview and they're a little on edge or they're not really up to speed. And so the interview doesn't go well. So, you know, th those are formulaic kinds of issues that we can resolve as a headhunter in bringing the candidate and the client together if we believe that they're they're really right for each other. So, you have to be a good listener in these debriefs to make sure you you get the full perspective from each person in that process. Rectify and facilitate where you can. And, and look, if it was a disaster, you end it, you cut the candidate loose so that they have realistic expectations and you bring in your next candidates for your client. Okay, uh, so 
after the debrief of the employer, step number 13 in the 30-step placement process is to uh, schedule a second interview, presuming that, that each individual wants a second interview. Okay, at this time, we uh, will set the second interview and we're going to start to do reference checks on our candidates to make sure that they are who they say they are and um, start to get perspective from those list of references and begin to share that with our clients. Now, uh, there are a lot of opinions on reference checks. There are law laws on reference checks that have changed in the last 25 years. So, so we have some clients who say, don't even bother with reference checks. And there are some cases when you just don't even want to do them. Uh, that's different than a background check. But, uh, you know, it, what you just have to discuss the reference check with your client. Sometimes they have their internal HR team that want to do the reference checks. They have a certain way they like to do it, and they don't want to outsource, outs, outsource that to their search partner. And that's fine, you know, whatever the client wants to do, that's how, how, to, how it will get done. But this would be the time when we, we begin uh, that process. Okay, uh, step number 15. We're going to schedule the second interview with the candidate and we're gonna start the trial closing process. The trial closing process. And uh, what we're gonna do with this is start to work on the opportunity. Is this, you know, can you do the job with them? Is this a job you think you wanna do? And do you wanna do the job with them? We're gonna to start to look at the money uh, in terms of closing, you know, what are their expectations for making a transition? Uh, normally we work with four numbers in the, in the compensation rollout discussion. You know, what's their verifiable compensation? Ideally, what they'd like to make in a new situation. What their minimal compensation would be to make a transition. And then our opinion, number four is our opinion on what the compensation could be or should be, and that's something that we discuss, you know, with the client, of course. Uh, number 16, step number 16, uh, we want to prep the employer and start trial, trial close the employer as well. You know, is Jimmy or Susie, if, if they're the right candidate, um, this is where I think we can close them, this is what we need, and uh, is this going to be work, workable for you and your team, and are there any internal equity issues with either title or role or compensation, and we work throughout uh, we work through all of those those issues. Okay, uh, step number 17, we're going to confirm the interview times, of course, with the employer and the candidate. You may have an assistant who does this for you, or you can do it yourself as the primary talent acquisition person, uh, but it has to be done, you know, time in place, transportation is in place, um, if they're coming in from out of town, hotels in place, airline reservations, all those things, you know, Uber, back and forth and so forth. All those things need to be seamless and flow like clockwork because you're working with a professional organization and the candidates should be treated as such. Sometimes employers want to meet candidates at the airport, pick them up in a personal vehicle or whatever. That's fine. But we need to make sure that there are no logistical issues around the interview because it's the candidates, usually the second interview, sometimes there's a third interview, but usually it's a candidate's uh, last chance to make a really good impression. They need to be focused and on it and ready to roll. And these uh, logistical issues uh, can only bring about, you know, negative consequences if there are any. Okay, uh, step number 18. We're going to debrief the candidate. They're going to come out of the interview again, just like we did in um, step number 11, I think it was. Uh, we're going to debrief the candidate. We're going to do a trial close again. Um, you know, if I can get the offer for you at this position and this level, will you say yes to the opportunity? Do I have your authority to accept? This is the legal uh, definition of the propitiating cause of the hire. Do I have your authority to accept the offer on your behalf? This is how we're going to close down the verbal, okay? And then we're going to obviously, once we have that, you know, all, all that information tied down, and so we're able to go to the employer and debrief the employer. And then, you know, if, if it's a love match and they want each other, okay, let's talk about the offer. You want me to extend the offer? And what, what offer do I have your authority to extend? Now, so I've pre-closed both and we're bringing them slowly, 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 slowly together. So I'm not in the business of extending offers that are going to be rejected. That's why I work on the closing process with both sides 
very precisely. I need to know what the candidate wants and what he or she doesn't want, what they'll accept and what they won't accept. And we want to do the same thing and have the same amount of information from our client, where do they want to extend and what they don't want to extend. And so we're slowly bringing these two people into communion with each other on an offer. Okay, um, now we are going to uh, start negotiating the closing process. Um, that's all contained there after the debriefs. I skipped that step, but it's number 20 and, and I, I've already covered it, but we're gonna close and negotiate both sides of the equation here, the candidate and the employer, to make sure that we have a fully acceptable deal. Uh, number 21, I'm going to offer acceptance and start date. I'm gonna extend the offer and acceptance on the phone with both parties. Well, not both parties at the same time, but get the authority to accept the deal from the candidate, authority to extend from the employer. Once the numbers all match, I'm going to say congratulations to the candidate. I accepted the offer for you on your behalf, and I'm going to call back the employer. Congratulations. I extended, and the candidate accepted. And we're going to talk about the start date. You know, I have very specific feelings about the start date. The notice period should be as short as possible, and the start date should be as quickly as possible. Uh, obviously, you know, both sides need to, this is not a secret, okay? This is not a secret that the interviews are happening and somebody's going to be hired. So the company should be ready to bring somebody to onboard them as quickly as possible. Why? Well, <laughs> step number 22, resignation prep. We have to prepare the candidate to resign properly, professionally, in as little amount of stress as possible, and in a way that actually eliminates in the client, in their company's mind, that they're gonna be able to retain this person's services via a counter offer. We do not lose deals to counter offers because we are slowly walking this process together to get into a zone where everybody is happy, and then we're not gonna let that happiness be interrupted by the, the candidates now previous company trying to lure him back with more money or lure her back with better opportunity or a raise or a promotion or whatever. The deal is done. The, the reason that the person is there, I'm here to uh, let you know about my resignation and how to make the transition as smooth as possible for me to get out of here and go on to my new company. Okay. So this is the resignation prep. We're going to spend about Oh, 30 minutes going over the psychology of how to resign, uh, the way to resign, who you resign with, what to say, what not to say. And then they're going to call me right before they go in. So I can give them a little boost of confidence, a little pep talk, a little, mo little motivational. So they're, you know, this is a very emotional event for many, many, many people, especially if they have good relationships with their boss. You know, the, and in a smaller company, the president of the company hired them personally, and they've been there for five or six years, and now, hey, it's time to go, and the boss may take it personally. And so we cover all that in our resignation prep, and we want to just give them a little bit of motivation before they go in to do it. It should be very quick, just a couple of minutes. They come back out. They call us. How'd it go? How'd it go? Let's, what were there any issues? What was the counteroffer? Blah, blah, blah. And we cover all that in the resignation debrief. Now, in the resignation debrief, which is a step number 23. We're all, what we're also doing is laying the groundwork to understand, is this a company who is going to try to lure their people back in with counter offers or are they not? And if so, how strong are the counter offers? You know, if the, if the person resigns, let's say with a very senior person in the company, a EVP, SVP, COO or president, uh, or owner, and they say, look, we're going to give you $50,000 to stay. Well, you know, $50,000 in anybody's book is a lot of money. That's, you know, $4,000 and change a month. After taxes, that's like $3,500 or $3,200. You know, that's almost $1,000 a week for somebody to stay. Even at a, at a high level of compensation, that's a lot of money. So we have to have the candidates prepared to make sure they realize the reasons why they want to change and why they love this new company so much. They've already accepted the job. So, you know, they've already kind of been divorced in their mind and now they're going to get remarried again and go work at another organization. So we want to make sure they don't go back on that promise and and we, re, we instill that 
you know, in our, our, our resignation prep uh, dialogue with the candidate. Okay, uh, so we debrief, and if there are any issues, uh, we relay them to our client. This is step number 23 of the resignation debrief. Now, um, if we sense that there is going to be a difficult transition period for the candidate, maybe they decided they needed to give a two-week notice period, or the company has asked them for a two-week notice period, which is, of course, you know, it's all magic. There's no notice period is required unless you have it stated in your employment agreement. Um, we may call our employer back and say, look, I know we were thinking about them starting in two weeks, but uh, uh, can they start tomorrow or they, can they start in three days from now? Because uh, uh, this situation could be a little difficult. And if we have a lot of lag time, uh, that company may come up with a create, very creative way to meet this person's needs. And then we have, we have a candidate that could become vulnerable to persuasion uh, by the employer. We'll talk about in another video all the reasons why you don't want to accept a counteroffer from your employer. However, in the heat of battle, when we have a offer and acceptance and um, you know resignation, we don't want to lose the right person for the wrong reason, which is a counteroffer. It's like the uh, the biggest deadly sin as a headhunter that you can lose someone to a counter. So um, anyway, uh, step number twenty four. Got to celebrate. All right, the resignation went well. Everything's confirmed. Have a little celebration. Ring the bell at your firm or your or your desk. And uh, number twenty five, invoice your client. Very important, right? Now in our case, we you know we work on retainer, so we have a couple of invoices that go out during the process. So the final invoice we wrapped up, it'll go out that day. And um, you know, make sure all the the bill uh, step numbers. You prep the invoice. You verify all the the billing information. That's step number 26, and you send it out to the client. Um, but basically, we just invoice our client right after everybody says yes and thank you. Um, step number 27, you've got to stay in touch with your candidate. This is absolutely critical. Uh, I talk to my candidates every day after they've resigned. I uh, feel it's my responsibility to make sure I stay abreast of any kind of situation that they may be going through at work. You know, this is somebody who's quit the team, right? So you don't know if they're going to be uh, treated professionally, fairly, unfairly. Uh, maybe persuasive people are going to be uh, dropped in around this person and try to get them to reconsider. And so you have to, as the headhunter or the TA person, you have to be uh, very intimately aware of what's going on in their surrounding, immediate surroundings at work. Okay, uh, number 28. Confirm that the candidate has left on their last day and confirm that the candidate has started on their start date. So, uh, especially with the start date, I would talk to the candidate the day before they're supposed to go to work. How's everything going? Are you ready to go to work tomorrow? Are you ready to meet, meet your new team? What can I do for you? Is there anything I can help you with? Do you need transportation? If you got all that lined up, you know, just don't forget, you're not going to turn right out of the driveway. You're turning left tomorrow. How do you feel about it? Are you excited? Make sure that this is a very good, healthy process for the candidate. And likewise, number 29, step number 29 in a 30-step process is you have to stay in touch with your employer, with your client, to make sure that they're ready for the new person. The receptionist, if there is one, realizes that a new person is starting today. There should be a sign in the lobby that says, welcome Johnny Jones to your first day with our company. And um, somebody should be there to greet them. Don't have the person go to a reception and then walk into the office kind of wandering aimlessly. That person's hiring manager should be there when that person shows up, right? Uh, we call it pre-closing, but avoiding the, you know, the issue, the objection. Make sure that they're there and then walk them to their desk, show them where they're going to work. All the computer stuff is going to be there, the desk and chair and all those things. Uh, their training schedule is already worked out, you know, assimilating into the organization, all the paperwork, the HR person's coming this time to get you all registered for all the programs. Introduce the person to their team. Show them where the break room is, the restroom is, the auditorium, you know, all the critical resources the company has to offer. Make sure that they're comfortable and you've allotted time in your schedule to do that. 
stay in touch with the candidate and the employer. And now the last step, according to Tony, was get the check, <laughs> which is make sure that, you know, you obviously you get paid for all the hard work that you've done. So look, these are the 30 steps in the placement process as originally authored by Tony Byrne. Uh, I'm going to do another video in the very near future on how I, as a very seasoned uh, professional headhunter, uh, have modified the 30 steps. And um, it'll be, a, you know, a little shorter version and, and probably more explanation into the actual individual steps, what we do and how we do it. Uh, but for today, I wanted to, to present you Tony's. Uh, this was a, a great achievement back, at, you know, 25 years ago when he, you know, he developed the 30 steps in the placement 2000. So um, thank you for listening. If you'd like to know more information about how to train your team, uh, either as an independent agency or a, a town acquisition unit, um, reach out to me. We'll have the information here in the video, buildorbitalsearch.com. And if you've liked this video and you want to subscribe, please do. That will allow us to give you more, much more content for you and your team to be able to grow and help you solve your company's problems. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.